How about now? Can you hear me now? Okay, that's the microphone I want to use. Yes. How about now? Great. Still? Yes. Okay. I think we. Okay. I think I've just, I think my connection is kind of poor. So when I've been trying to switch the microphone, it doesn't actually want to do the thing. But yes, I can see my audio is making audio noises. Awesome. It only took twenty minutes. <laughs> or actually, ten. Sorry, ten. It took ten minutes. All right. So as I was trying to say, polar coordinates. Cartesian coordinates, you go over and up. Polar coordinates, you instead get the angle towards your point first and then go how much you want to go in that direction. So first rotate an angle, typically denoted by theta, and then we go a distance of r in that direction. So to get to kind of a similar looking point, we could say we're going to go an angle of theta and then a distance of r. And that point there we would call r comma theta. It is typical to list the r value first and the angle value second.
Um, so if we put these two pixels on top of each other, superimposing them, we get the following relationships. At this point here, we can either think of it as going in angle theta and a distance r, or going over x and up y. So we can use some trigonometry here to figure out that cosine of theta is equal to x over r. So x is equal to r times cosine theta. Sine of theta is equal to y over r. So y is equal to r sine theta. So typically, these are the equations we think of using if we want to go from polar coordinates to rectangular. If I gave you an R and a theta, we could use these equations to find the rectangular coordinates X and Y. Similarly, the other equations we have are X squared plus Y squared equals R squared, Pythagorean theorem, and tangent of theta equals Y over X. If you actually wanted to solve for R and solve for theta, you could say that R is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared, and theta is equal to the inverse tangent of y over x. Although, frankly, I think these first equations are more useful. It's more useful to actually think of it this way and then modify it however you need it, as opposed to remembering the screen. And really, I would say you should just remember this picture. Remember this picture of this right triangle. You always know how to relate x, y, theta. So those are the relationships that get you from polar to rectangular and from rectangular to polar. And although normally we don't think of a distance as being negative, I certainly could describe a polar coordinate with a negative R value. So for example, if I wanted to say, locate the polar coordinates below, let's actually do a few. So we could have say the polar coordinate two comma pi over two. So that means it's going a distance of two in the angle pi over two direction. And yes, almost exclusively, we write our angles as radians, not as degrees when writing polar coordinates. So this would be the point that goes an angle of pi over two, and then we're gonna go one, two units in that direction. So this point right there, that is the polar coordinate two comma pi over two. It's the same as the rectangular coordinate x comma y equal to zero comma two. Zero in the x direction, two in the y direction. If I were to say I wanted to find the point negative three comma pi over four, well pi over four I know is the angle 45 degrees, so I'm thinking of going in the direction of 45 degrees, which is looking like that. There's my pi over four angle, but I'm not gonna go three in the positive direction. Since my R is negative three, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. So I'm gonna go this way. And if that's a one, two, three, then the distance is about right there. So that's my point, negative three comma pi over four. I'm going in the direction of the angle pi over four, but I'm going 180 degrees or pi radians up around from that. Another interesting facet of polar coordinates is that they're not unique. So if I was describing a point in two dimensions, with an x-y coordinate, each distinct pair of x-y coordinates would give you a distinct point. But you can use different polar coordinates to describe the same point. Here's what I mean. So let's say we actually, so I could pick another way of describing this point here. Like, for example, the polar coordinate r theta equal to negative two comma three pi over two also ends up at the same point is the same 
as the x y coordinate zero comma two. Right, if we do an angle of three pi over two and then go in the opposite direction two, we're gonna end up at that same top point there. Similarly, here's another one, r comma theta equal to negative plus you, three pi over two comma two. Since there's lots of ways of describing the same angle, either adding a full revolution or subtracting a full revolution, you can describe this point here in polar coordinates many different ways. So this angle here is negative three pi over two, and I'm just gonna go two in that direction. Oh yeah, that's the same point. Similarly, actually let's do another example. So we could also find, let's find two different polar coordinates. Um, for the Cartesian coordinate x comma y equal to, mm, sure, two comma two. So, two comma two over two up two, and good. But now we want to use some polar coordinates to describe this point. Um, no, we should do it that way. I, so I don't think I should do that. I've picked examples that the angle is easy to find. So I think we can agree that for this point here, what's the angle going to be? From along the line y equals x. The angle's looking an awful lot like right. So one way of describing this would be that my r comma theta is, well, I know the angle part is pi over four. Now be careful. The r part is not two. That's not a distance of two. If we go over two and up two, we actually have to find the length of that hypotenuse. So the r value is gonna be exactly the square root of two squared plus two squared, which is the square root of eight. Or if you wanna simplify that, you could write it as two root two. That's one valid way of writing this. Another valid way would be to add a half a revolution to our angle. So add pi and say that another way of writing this would be r comma theta is equal to, the angle should be negative, sorry, positive, apologies. Pi plus pi over four is five pi over four. And now since we're pointing in the opposite direction that we want to be going, we're gonna make our r negative, negative two root two comma five by four works totally fine. Or you could even do a full revolution. I know I said two, let's do three. You could say r comma theta is gonna be nine pi over four for our angle. And our, and our r is positive two root two. Those are all accurate ways of doing this. Which is kind of weird, right? You would think points are unique, but depending on your system, they're not. Okay, but then let's kind of move along here. So it's good to be able to go between polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates, but really we want to talk more about equations using polar coordinates and Cartesian coordinates and being able to go back and forth between them. So for example, we're gonna convert some polar equations, sorry, some Cartesian equations By the way, Cartesian coordinate system comes from the name of the person who invented it, Descartes, right? Cartesian, there's the Descartes and Descartes right there. Just fun fact. Convert some Cartesian equations to polar equations, which is usually the easier direction to get. So let's start off with a nice one like y equal to four, which we certainly know how to draw Right, y equal to four looks like this nice straight line here. But now we want to convert it to Cartesian. So when you're converting something to Cartesian, if you've got an x or a y, you're just going to replace it with what it's equal to. So we know that in Cartesian coordinates, x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta. So we're going to replace or rewrite this as r times sine theta equal to four. 
just like with Cartesian equations, we usually try to isolate y as a function of x. So like if I had x squared plus y equal to two, I would isolate y equal to two minus x squared. The same sort of thing is true here in that we try to isolate r as a function of theta. That is the typical way to go unless we can't. So here we would divide both sides by sine theta and get r equal to four divided by sine theta. Or more likely r equal to four times cosecant of theta. Which is kind of neat. So this straight line is really r equal to four cosecant of theta. So let's actually think about this for a second, just kind of see how this works. If theta equals pi over two, then r is gonna equal four times cosecant of pi over two, and cosecant of pi over two is one. So great, when the angle is pointing straight up, you get a radius of four, which is right there. So point zero comma four in Cartesian coordinates. R is four, theta is pi over two. Let's make our angle a little bit smaller. Let's say our angle was pi over six. Well, then R is gonna equal four times cosecant of pi over six. Sine of pi over six is one half, so cosecant of pi over six is two. And this is four times two, which is eight. So check this out. When the angle is 30 degrees, the radius is eight. And that seems reasonable for my picture, right? This length, if that angle is pi over six, it totally seems like that length would be a length of eight, if that's a length of four. And as your angle gets shallower and shallower and shallower, closer and closer to zero, the value of cosecant gets larger and larger and larger. So you just move further and further and further out towards the points that are further and further to the right. Or if your angle is going towards pi, towards pi your values are gonna go more and more to the left. Kind of neat. Um, if there aren't any questions, we'll do another example. So let's look at this example. Ooh, yeah, I like this. Let's say we have y equal to negative x. Which we know how to draw. Like that, you might be able to just guess what the answer to this one is in polar coordinates because you can see that for any point on this line, the angle never changes. If you have a line that goes through the origin, all the points on the line have the same angle and just a different value of r. Um, but it's good to show the work as well. So I'm going to replace y and x with what they're equal to. So I'm going to say that r sine theta is equal to negative r cosine theta. And here I would, yeah, I'd probably do that. So I guess to be very consistent, I should bring everything to one side, say R sine theta plus R cosine theta equals zero, factor out the R, you get sine theta plus cosine theta equals zero. So either you get R equal to zero, which is always the origin, which certainly is a point on this line, or you get, sine theta plus cosine theta equal to zero, which I would rewrite as sine theta equal to negative cosine theta or sine theta divided by cosine theta, which is tangent theta equal to negative cosine theta divided by cosine theta, which is negative one. So if tangent theta equals negative one, then what's theta equal to? I mean, there's a lot of correct answers. The answer I would pick would be theta equal to three pi over four, 135 degrees, which is just 45 degrees plus another 90 degrees. An equally valid answer would be theta equal to negative pi over four. And I will point out that if you actually calculate the inverse tangent of negative one, I said, if you go one step further and say, theta equals the inverse tangent of negative one, the, the only value that's correct to say the inverse tangent of negative one is negative pi over four. Because right? when you find the inverse tangent of a number, it's a function and should only give you one answer as opposed to multiple answers. 
So this is equal to negative nine. But as far as describing the equation of this line, writing it as theta equals theta pi over four, theta equals negative pi over four, are both are valid ways of writing it. In a similar way, yeah, let's do one more. In a similar way, if I wanted to describe the line, say, I'm gonna make another easy choice here, y equal to the square root of three times x, this is another line through the origin. And the lines to the origin are always just the angle is equal to some constant angle, right? Because if you draw this line, no matter what point you pick, the line to that point is always making the same angle with the x-axis. So here, what I would probably actually do is say, since I know what's gonna happen, y over x equals the square root of three, and then we know that y over x is tangent to theta. And then root three is one of those numbers we're supposed to know. If tangent of theta is equal to root three, theta should be pi over three. Or if you want the intermediate step, we can say that theta is equal to the inverse tangent of root three. And the inverse tangent or the arc tangent of root three is pi over three. So the equation of this line, instead of y equal to the square root of three times x, is theta equal to pi over three. How do you know that theta is negative pi over four? Is it, yeah, it really is memorizing the unit circle. If you know that tangent of theta is equal to negative one, then we know that the angle should be either negative pi over four or positive three pi over four. And then things can be stranger. You might not have a line that actually goes to the origin. You can have something like y equal to two x plus one. And then I'll remind you, our job is to do, first to rewrite it in terms of r and theta. And then after that, if possible, it's not always possible, but if possible, isolate r. So here we have r sine theta equals r cosine theta plus one. Well, we can isolate r. It's gonna be a little weird looking. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot something there. I missed an important two. That should be two times r cosine theta. Bring all the r's to one side. So you have r sine theta minus two r cosine theta equal to one. Factor out the r, r sine theta minus two cosine theta equal to one. And then finally divide by whatever's multiplying r to get r equal to one over sine theta minus two cosine theta. Not a particularly nice equation, but it is the equation of the line y equals two x plus one. Think something like this. In polar coordinates. Interesting. And then there's some things that make more sense. So straight lines and polar coordinates don't usually make a lot of sense. They just, you wouldn't write them that way. It's a much more natural fit for the Cartesian coordinate system. But there are some curves that are a much more natural fit for the polar coordinate system. For example, a circle. If you have the equation x squared plus y squared equal to 25, right, which is a circle of radius five, I mean, I've kind of told you the answer without even doing any work. It's a circle of radius five. The equation in polar coordinates is gonna be r equals five. So here's my circle. And if I rewrite this, well, we know that I don't, so what I would recommend here is you shouldn't replace x and y with r cosine theta and r sine theta specifically. You should remember that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So instead, we should just rewrite this equation as r squared equal to 25, which means r equals 5. We don't really need to say r equals plus or minus 5. We should just stick with r equals 5. Because if r equals 5, 
kind of like when y equals four, there isn't any restriction on the other variable. When y equals four, we saw, I know we didn't talk about this a whole lot, but in that first problem, right, when y was equal to four, x is anything. You can move as far or left or right as you want. So over here, when the radius is equal to five, the other variable theta can be anything. So theta can be pi over six or pi over four or any angle, which gets you every point on the circle because you're just letting theta go all the way from zero to two pi. Because theta can be any. So you get the whole entire circle. So it's really, really easy to write the equation of a circle centered at the origin in polar coordinates. It's less easy when it's not centered at the origin. So let's look at another example. Let's say we have, sure, x squared plus, yeah, I like that one, y minus 3 squared equal to 9. Which I will certainly point out is a circle the center of that circle is the point zero comma three, and the radius of this circle is the square root of nine, which is three. Well, let's do it. Let's change it all to being in terms of sine and cosines. So we're going to rewrite this as r cosine theta squared plus parentheses r sine theta minus three squared equal to nine. Now we're going to simplify. So we're going to multiply out this part here. We're going to get r squared cosine squared theta plus this foils out as r squared sine squared theta minus 6r sine theta plus 9 equals 9. We can cancel the 9s. And from the rest of this, I see and r squared cosine squared plus r squared sine squared, that's just equal to r squared. So what we have now is r squared minus 6r sine theta equal to zero. We factor out an r, we have r times r minus 6 sine theta equal to zero. So we either get r equal to zero, which is not really helpful, right? Sure, r equal to zero is a point on this graph because the origin does happen to be a point on this graph. But the more useful piece is r minus six sine theta equal to zero or r equal to six sine theta. So this circle centered at zero three with a radius of three is given by the polar equation, r equals six sine theta. And there's actually kind of a really nice correspondence between when you have r equal to a multiple of either sine or cosine of theta. You always get a circle centered on the appropriate axis and it's centered at essentially half the distance of the coefficient. So for example, if I was going to graph r equal to 2 cosine theta, I know it's going to be a circle. It's going to be centered on the x-axis. And instead of having a center of 3 away, where 3 is half of 6, it's going to have a center of 1 away. Here's how I really find it. I plot some points. Plot theta equal to 0 and theta equal to pi over 2. If theta equals 0, r is going to equal 2 times cosine of 0, which is 2 times 1. And if theta equals pi over 2, r is going to equal 2 times cosine of pi over 2, which is 0. So here are the two points I'm getting. I'm getting theta equals 0, which points to the right. And my radius is 2. And then when theta equals pi over 2, my radius is 0, which means whenever your radius is 0, where are you at? The origin, right? If your radius is zero, you haven't moved away from the origin. It doesn't matter what direction you're pointing in. 
So those are the ends of the diameter of my circle. So it looks like this. I think it's actually harder to go from this polar equation, r equals two cosine theta, back to the, um, the rectangular, the Cartesian equation. Here's how you do it. So how to go back. And actually in general, going from polar to Cartesian is usually harder. Here's your, here's your motivation. If you're trying to go back to polar, sorry, trying to go back to Cartesian, you want either to see R squared or R times cosine or R times sine. You don't have that, you wanna do something to make that happen. The usual things we try doing are either squaring both sides of an equation or multiplying both sides by R. In this case, if I have R equal to two cosine theta, squaring both sides is not gonna help me out so much Although it would give me R squared on the left, it would give me cosine squared on the right, which is not so bad. But multiplying both sides by R would help me out. So multiply both sides by R. On the left-hand side, I'm going to get R squared. On the right-hand side, I'm going to get 2 times R times cosine theta. And then we can change things to being polar coordinates. We know that X equals R cosine theta. Y, sorry, I said polar, I meant Cartesian. We have x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and we know that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. So we can replace this r cosine theta with x and this r squared with x squared plus y squared. So now we have an equation fully in rectangular coordinates. x squared plus y squared equal to 2x. And then we can bring everything to the left, x squared minus 2x plus y squared equals zero. We can complete the square here so that we can write the equation of the circle in the standard way. x squared minus 2x, I'm gonna add the negative two divided by two is negative one and you square it, I'm gonna add one to both sides. And then this part right here is x minus one squared plus y squared equal to one and yeah, that's a circle. The center is one comma zero. The radius is the square root of one, which is one, which is exactly the circle that we drew up here. It's kind of neat, I think. It could be for the mental reason. Let's do a couple more where we convert the other way and then we'll do some graphing, which is where things get really kind of interesting. I should say some graphing of part of polar equations. So if I wanted to say convert to a Cartesian equation, well, we just talked about kind of how to do that. So if we have R equal to six secant theta, So I'm always trying to make either R squared pop up or R times sine or R times cosine. Those are the things I'm really, really, really trying to make happen. I guess you could also say tangent of theta. That would be acceptable. If you can make tangent show up, tangent is equal to Y over X. Um, so first of all, if I have a secant or a cosecant, let's just rewrite that as an X or as a sine or a cosine. So R is equal to six divided by cosine theta. I can multiply both sides by cosine theta to get R cosine theta equal to six. And then R cosine theta is equal to X. So this becomes the equation X equal to six. So there's our vertical line, X equal to six. Most of these equations are easier to graph if we can turn them into a Cartesian equation because we usually kind of know how to graph Cartesian equations. Let's look at another example. Let's say we have R squared equal to sine theta times secant cubed theta. Okay, this one looks kind of bonkers. 
again, the first thing I'm going to think about doing is sines and cosines. So instead of sine times secant cubed, I would rather write this as r squared equal to sine of theta divided by cosine cubed theta. And I really want the same amount of r as cosine. So like, I'm thinking I want to multiply both sides by cosine cubed. So I have r squared times cosine cubed theta equal to sine theta. But I really, really want an r cubed cosine cubed. Because what I have currently right now, if I break this up into kind of the useful pieces, is I have an r times a cosine times an r times a cosine. And then I'm running out of r's, but I still have a cosine equal to sine. It'd be really, really convenient if I had an r times that cosine and an r times that sine. Well, great. I can achieve that by multiplying both sides by r. And then I've got x times x times x equal to y. So kind of a funky way to write it, right? If you wrote r squared equal to sine theta times secant cubed theta, no one would ever guess that that was the graph of y equals x cubed without doing all this work, but it is. So let's talk about some polar graphs. There's two or three types of polar graphs that you probably should have some passing familiarity with. So graphs of polar equations. One of them we've already kind of talked about, but we'll come back to it in a minute, which was just the R equal to either a multiple of sine or a multiple of cosine. In fact, let me actually, let's write those down first. So if you have R equal to yeah, let's, yeah. So like R equal to six sine theta or R equal to four cosine theta. R equal to six sine theta is a circle on the Y axis centered at zero comma three. Similarly, R equal to four cosine theta is a circle on the X axis centered at zero comma four. Sorry, apologies, four comma zero. Mm, that's not right. Four zero is the end point, two zero is the center, which really speaks to how I actually figure out where the center is. When I do anything like this, I'm really just gonna find the two endpoints of the circle. One of them is the origin always, and one of them is some point that's either on the x or the y axis. So what I'm really doing here is I'm evaluating each of these when theta equals zero and theta equals pi over two. For this first one, if I plug in zero, six times sine of zero is zero. Great. That doesn't help me a whole lot, but it's fine. But if I plug in pi over two, six times sine of pi over two is six. So the two points on this circle are the origin and the point zero six. And you know what's halfway between those? The center, zero three. Similarly, for this equation here, the two points you get plugging in theta equal to zero and theta equal to pi over two are r equal to four and r equal to zero. So you get the two points four comma zero and zero comma zero, taking them as of, that's Cartesian coordinates, and halfway between those is the point two comma zero. If you happen to have a negative coefficient, so if r is equal to like negative nine sine of theta, then your radius, I didn't even talk about the radius up here, sorry, back that up. We have a circle and it's centered at zero comma negative nine over two. I didn't talk about the radius for any of these because I, sh well, I should have really, but the radius is gonna be half of that value because if the origin is one of the points and this is the center, the distance from the origin to zero three is three. The distance from the origin to two zero is two. 
So here, the radius is six divided by two, the radius is two divide, four divided by two. Here, the radius is nine divided by two. And if you had like R equal to negative eight cosine theta, the center is negative four comma zero and the radius is positive four. So these are some basic polar equations. We can draw them all, right? I mean, this last one, if I draw this last one, it's really just gonna be, I'm gonna get the point negative eight zero and zero zero and then draw the circle. And here's the center at negative four zero. But nothing really special. So these ones I think are kind of the bit, the most basic ones that we usually encounter. R equals a multiple of sine or a multiple of cosine. And then we have some other things. So these are the circles. The circles that aren't centered to the origin, right? There's also, just as a reminder, stuff like R equal to six. That's also a circle. Is a circle centered at the origin with a radius of six. Something kind of interesting about this circle versus these circles. For this circle here, the angle has to go at least one full revolution, meaning the angle has to go at least from zero all the way around to two pi to sweep out or draw out the entire circle. And kind of counterintuitively, that is not true for these other circles here. Let me show you what I mean. So let's actually do the work of plotting the points for graphing. Let's do R equal to four cosine theta. So normally you don't want to spend this much time graphing a, anything really, but the idea is we're going to plot some points. So we're going to start off with the usual nice angles. So theta, r equal to four cosine theta. I'm going to pick the angles zero, pi over six, pi over four, pi over three, pi over two. And then going on to the second quadrant, two pi over three. Um, what's the next angle? <laughs> 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 6, and finally pi. And I'm going to do my best to draw this. Right, let's start off. You really yeah, want the right side of this. So I'm going to try and give myself some angles here really quickly to make it so I can draw this picture kind of nice. So there's the angle pi over 4. This is about right there. Again, not going to look like it's perfect. I'm trying to make it look decent. And there's pi over three, about. Okay. So bear with me for a minute. Cosine of zero is one, four times one is four. So if we go out one, I should I have a ruler. Why I should, if I'm trying to do this nice, I might as well use all the parts of the ruler. <laughs> So we're gonna go one, two, three. Okay, so there's one point on my circle. And then when the angle is pi over six, four times cosine of pi over six is four times root three over two, which is two times root three. Root three is about 1.7. So two times root three is about 3.4. So in the pi over six direction, I'm gonna go about 3.4 as best as I can. So here's where my, let's see, about 3.4. So we're going one, two, three, yeah, about right there. Okay. Cosine of pi over four is root two over two. So I get two root two. Root two is about 1.4. Two times 1.4 is about 2.8. So I'm going to go about right there. And then finally for pi over three, Four times cosine of pi over three is four times one half, which is just good old two. So I'm going about two in the that direction. And halfway through, cosine of pi over two is zero. So check this out. 
my angle going from zero to pi over two, or zero to 90 degrees, has gotten me how much of the circle? Half of the circle. So I'm gonna get the other half when I do the other, the next quadrants worth of angles. We should check this out because it does kind of inform us how we're gonna do later things. So cosine of two pi over three over in quadrant two is negative. So cosine of two pi over three is negative one half. So we're gonna be getting four times negative one half, which is negative two. So look at this, the angle two pi over three is pointing that way but then I have to go in the opposite direction because my R value is negative two. So I end up down here instead. Like that. And then the same sort of way, cosine of three pi over four is negative root two over two, so I end up with negative two root two. Cosine of five pi over six is negative root three over two, so I end up with negative two root three. And cosine of pi is negative one, so I end up with negative four. So my values look like just the reflections of these things down here. So I end up with this bottom half of the circle, which I did not draw nearly as well. But that's kind of the idea is that if you you only need half of the angles that you would normally need to get any one of these circles that's not centered on the origin. So it's worth keeping in mind, right? Here, we only needed theta to go from zero to pi to get the entire circle. This becomes important when you start trying to find like the area under or between a polar curve. If you were to find the area of the circle and you were to integrate from zero to two pi, you would get double the area you actually needed. So something to keep in mind. I know we're not quite there yet, but we will be. Okay, so. Let's look at some other shapes. Oh, some other polar shapes, like this one. Let's look at graphing r equal to one minus sine of theta, which I will just tell you is called a cardioid. This is vaguely heart shaped. Um, yeah, so let's do the same sort of thing. Mm, yeah, same thing. Yeah. So we're going to plot some points. Try not to plot too many. There is a lot of symmetry involved here. So theta and r. Um, yeah. I think there's a way of graphing polar things on Desmos as well. If you're trying to use that, I haven't explored it though, so I should take a look at that. So let's look at a few angles. We're not going to do quite as many. Zero pi over six, pi over two, bless you. Oops, I forgot the five pi, let's look at the other, sorry, five pi over six, pi, seven pi over six, and three pi over two. I'm picking the pi over sixes because they have a nicer value, right? Sine of pi over six is one half. So these values are gonna be not too terrible to try to graph and then 11 pi over six, and then all the way around to two pi. Okay, so sine of zero is zero. So r, so one minus that's gonna be one minus zero, which is one. Sine of pi over six is one half, so you get one minus one half, which is one. Sine of pi over two is one. Sine of five pi over six is one half. Sine of pi is zero. Sine of seven pi over six is negative one half. So one minus minus one half is three halves. Sine of three pi over two is negative one and one minus negative one is two. Sine of 11 pi over six is also negative one half. So we get three halves again. Finally, all the way around, sine of two pi is zero. So you get one minus zero, which is one. So now we're gonna plot these points. And I wish I, oh man, I even have some polar graphing paper that I printed out, but I clearly didn't bring it with me, so oh well. So let's try and give ourselves the angles we want. Really, we want pi over six, which is 30 degrees. I should have brought my curve corrector. I'm trying not to make this look too terrible here. So there is theta equal to pi over six, or on this side, 
theta equals seven pi over six. And then the other one, let's see if I can get some decent symmetry here. Okay, there's theta equal to five pi over six or theta equal to 11 pi over six. And let's, sure, let's say that's one. Okay. Sorry, usually I don't try to be so specific with my graphing, but I want you guys to see a good graph. All right, so when the angle is zero, the value is one, so we're out here. When the angle is pi over six, the r is one half, so we're going one half along that line. What I usually do if I'm trying to eyeball it is I go one half along the x-axis and I kind of draw a circle up to the point there. It's like right there, kind of. you guys see that? And then when the angle is pi over two, we get zero. When the angle is five pi over six, I'm also getting one half, so it's about right there. When the angle is pi, which points to the left, my value is one. When my angle is seven pi over six, my value is one and a half or three halves. So I'm gonna go one and a half in that direction. I guess I can use my ruler here. When my angle is three pi over two, I get a value of one, two. My value is my angle is 11 pi over 6, they could also get a value of 3 halves. So here's all my points. Here, 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 here. So when I try and draw this, it's going to look like this. Yeah, it's a little pointy at the origin. That's about how it looks. And that's a cardioid. Now, some of the times when you try and draw these cardioids, you can kind of get away with just looking at the four cardinal directions, right? Left, right, up, down. Zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and then two pi again. But sometimes funky things happen in the middle. So we have to be careful. Let's look at a couple more examples. Oh my gosh, I'm going to page here. Yeah, we should do that first. All right, let's look. Okay, let's look at two more graphs. Yeah, two more. The graphing gets a little bit tedious. Let's look at another cardioid. Let's say I wanted to graph r equal to two plus cosine theta. So here's what I'm going to do. This is the short and sweet version. Here are the angles I really want to look at. Zero, pi over two, pi, three pi over two, and two pi once again. And we kind of know, learn to know that you have a cardioid when you essentially have a constant plus or minus just some, multi some multiple of sine or cosine. So this could be like two plus one half cosine, or two minus three cosine, something like that. So here are, well, cosine of zero is one, so you get two plus one is three. Cosine of pi over two is zero, so you get two plus zero is two. Cosine of pi is negative one, so you get one. Cosine of three pi over two is zero, so you get two. And cosine of two pi is one, so you get three. The worry, the thing that you have to look out for is sometimes you can get multiple places where this is equal to zero, and then you have like this weird kind of loop around the origin. We don't have that here. So, yeah, graphing this. When the angle is zero, I get an R value of three. When the angle is pi over two, I get an R value of two. When the angle is pi, I get an R value of one. When the angle is three pi over two, I get an R value of two. And then back here. So this kind of looks, I mean, I'm not wonderful at drawing these, it kind of looks like this.
and kind of how much that's what I'm looking for here. I don't really have it over there. How much kind of indent you have there is really not something that's easy to know without doing more detailed graphing. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I really want to say about the cardioid for now. It's one of the type of graph I think you should be aware of, and those are roses. So roses have the following form. You either have R equal to sine of some multiple of theta, like sine of three theta, or cosine of five theta, or you have, well, I should say, you have an odd multiple of theta or you have an even multiple of theta. So you have like cosine of two theta or R equal to sine of four theta. So these are the two different types of things that could happen. And they're not hard to graph once you know how to graph them. So let's start off with R equal to sine of three theta. So here's what I know. R equal to sine of three theta is a rose with three evenly spaced petals, like a flower. And what I'm going to do is I'm really going to find one of them. So when you have an odd number of petals, one of them always ends up being on one of the coordinate axes. But let me just show you how I graph this. So I'm going to pick angles that really give me where sine is the biggest. So I really want 3 theta to equal pi over 2. So my angle is going to be pi over 6. So my angle is pi over 6. I know that my r value is sine of pi over 2, which is 1. But unfortunately, pi over 6 is not the most convenient angle for me to deal with. So what I would actually do in reality is test two angles. When it's off, I'm going to test the angle 0 and pi over 2, just like I was doing with the circle. So if my angle is zero, my R value is not very helpful, it's zero. It wouldn't have been helpful if it was cosine. And then I'm gonna test the angle pi over two. Sine of three pi over two is negative one. So here's what I know. I know that when the angle is pi, pi over two, so when it should be pointing in the up direction, my R value is negative one, so I'm actually pointing in the down direction. So right there, I'm going one in that direction. And then the other two petals should be equally spaced 120 degrees apart from that angle. Because there's three of them, and 360 divided by three is 120. So I've got one over here at an angle of pi over six, right? Because 90 plus 30 is 120 degrees, or two pi over three radians. And then the other one should be over here. So if you look at the angles, pi over six, pi over, sorry, two, sorry, not even either that, five pi over six. If you plug in five pi over six, you get sine of 15 pi over six, which is really equal to sine of five pi over two, which is one. So when the angle is pi over six, you get that point there. When the angle is five pi over six, you get that point there. And when the angle is pi over two, you get that point there. And then the actual graph does the following. You don't actually have to be able to draw it out in the right order. I am drawing it out in the right order, meaning as your angle would increase. So as the angle, when the angle starts at zero, you have an R of zero. And then as the angle gets bigger, the radii get bigger up until an angle of pi over six, which is as big as possible. And then the radii start getting smaller as the angle is moving away from that biggest value. So you back to zero. And then you move over into this way right here. Because your, oh yeah, your R starts being negative. 
right? Because if your angle is bigger than pi over three, well, sine of three times an angle bigger than pi over three is an angle bigger than pi. So sine starts being negative. So when you get to that, you start pointing this way in this negative direction. And then you finish that and then you come off and end up doing that there. So sine of three theta, the way I would actually graph it, and I've done a little bit more work here than I would actually do in real life, is you identify which axis one of the pedals lives on and then the other number of pedals are equally spaced out apart from that. If I wanted to graph, and it's always more challenging when it's more than three, if I wanted to graph r equal to cosine of five theta is going to have five pedals. And I'm going to find one of them by either trying theta equal to zero or theta equal to pi over two. Actually, I'm going to try both. And whichever one gives me not zero is the one that's going to be helpful. So if I plug in zero for theta, R is going to be cosine of zero, which is one. So great. I know in the theta equals zero direction, which is to the right, I have a pedal on that axis. And then my other four pedals are equally spaced from this one. And equally spacing five things is something you're about to see that I'm not very good at. But I'm going to try anyway. So here's one of my pedals. And then, oof. so this is where a compass would be really useful, or a, a protractor would be really useful, but I don't have one. Um, yeah, we'll just wing it. It looks so bad. See, like, where is the fifth one go, James? Oh my gosh, that's maybe the worst time I've ever done doing this. So, sorry. Um, wow, that looks, oh my gosh, that's laughably bad. Let's try that again. Um, so here's what I would probably actually try to do. I know one of them's there. And then 360 divided by five is 72 degrees. So they're equally spaced out at intervals of 72 degrees. So 72 degrees might be like about like that, probably a little too shallow. And then another 72 degrees is maybe about like that. And then about like that. About like that. It should look like a nice star, kind of. Like your usual five-pointed star. So this is going to look something like this. And then you're going to have this. And then you're going to have that. And they shouldn't actually overlap each other. And they should be the same, right? See, they should be the same kind of Thickness. So there's my best, my best, uh, my better than last attempt at r equal to cosine of five theta. And this point here would be the point r equals one theta equals zero. Okay, two more. So here's where things get really weird. Maybe not. So if I was going to graph r equal to two, not two, oh, sure, why not? Two cosine of four theta. Also a rose. How many petals would you guess it would have? I was like, clearly he's setting us up to be wrong, which I am, but go ahead and guess anyway. So this one had five petals. This one had three pedals. So if you were going to make an educated guess that seemed like it could be right, you might guess that cosine of four theta would have four pedals, which is wrong. But why is it wrong? Well, because you get this doubling kind of effect when you have an even number there. So this actually has, exactly. It's kind of because of how, like, with the circle, 
you got the whole thing and only half the paper, half the angles worth and it doubles back on itself because you have an odd coefficient. When you have an even coefficient there, you don't get the doubling back on itself. The doubling actually ends up doubling with a different graph. So for an even number of petals, they're still equally spaced out. And in this case, I would graph it by figuring out if they're either on axis or not. What I mean by that is for cosine of four theta, if you let theta equal an angle that points in the direction of one of the four axes, zero, pi over two, pi, three, pi over two, you will get something that extends to the end of that pedal. So if theta equals zero, you're gonna get R equal to two times cosine of zero, which is two. The same is true if you let theta equal pi over two, pi or three pi over two. No matter which of those angles you plug in, you're gonna get cosine of two pi or cosine of four pi or cosine of six pi, which are all equal to one. So all of these angles result in R equal to two times one, which is two. So cosine typically is always the one if it's an even number that are on axis. So you're gonna get these four petals, and then you're gonna also get four additional petals that are inner that are evenly spaced in between them. So we've got these four here. If you have the opportunity to like graph these using some sort of nice graphing tool, I recommend it because they actually look kind of neat when they're not drawn terribly. And then the other four are gonna occur in between these two or in between each pair of two. So like that, and then have kind of like that and so on. And again, they shouldn't overlap each other, which is why drawing them by hand usually looks not so wonderful. So there's an idea of what happens if you have R equal to two cosine four theta. It's an eight petaled rose. And just to be complete here, if we were to graph, say, R equal to three sine of two theta, that's going to be a four petal rose. But the petals are off axis, meaning you don't get the largest value of the function when you plug in one of the four directions. If you plug in, for example, here, theta equal to pi over four, r is gonna be three times sine of two times pi over four. Two times pi over four is pi over two, sine of pi over two is one, so we get three. So our petals are looking like this. One of them is like that. One of them is like this, like that. And hopefully the, my language choice is making sense, right? These petals here, I'm describing as being off axis because they are not sitting on an axis. Apologies for the lack of symmetry in my brain. So sine of an even multiple, they end up off axis. Cosine of an even multiple, they end up on axis. And then the extra ones are evenly spaced about. So if you had, I'm not going to draw it, but if you're graphing r equal to sine of six theta, you'd have 12 petals that would be spaced off axis. So basically they split the difference of an axis. So you'd have something terrible with like three of them equally spaced in each quadrant. Which again, my picture does not do it justice. All right, so. Oh my gosh, this is a lot of time talking about graphing these things. I do, I would like, if you have access to, I mean, I'm sure you can find some sort of polar graphing utility online. I can probably find one in Lincoln in, in Canvas. Um, I would encourage you just to do a little bit of exploration, just to kind of see what things look like. And if you change like what's the difference between graphing like R equals one plus two cosine theta, versus r equal to two plus one cosine theta. They don't look that different as far as equations, but the actual graphs have a bit of difference to them. Um, where we're going next is, how do we just 
terrible. Mm. Yeah, I don't know why you do that. So let me ask you all, has your teacher talked about finding the, has your teacher talked about polar coordinates at all? Maybe, yes, no, okay. Have they talked about finding the slope of a tangent line to a graph defined not parametrically like we were doing last class, but with polar coordinates? Often it gets skipped. So I will point out just as an example, but we're probably, probably not gonna go through all of it because it gets really kind of gross. So if you have the polar equation, which we graphed before, r equal to one minus sine of theta. The graph looked like this. It was a cardioid centered on the y-axis at, at these points, one, zero. And it kind of looked like this. The previous picture was probably a little bit better, but oh well. And so you might ask the question like, What's the slope of the tangent line at theta equal to zero? So what's going on right there? Well, we can find this if we think about it as a parametric equation. So we can say that x equals r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, and then we can replace the r with what r is equal to. So we can think of this as some function of theta. So x and y are really both parameterized as f of theta times cosine theta and f of theta times sine theta, which already feels like it's going to be terrible to find dy dx. So to find dy dx, hold your horses, it's going to be dy d theta over dx d theta, just like it was when it was parameterized as a function of t. But now things are worse because to find dy d theta, product rule. You have a function of theta times a function of theta. So it's going to be f prime of theta times sine of theta plus f of theta times cosine theta over dx d theta, same deal. It's going to be f prime of theta times cosine theta plus f of theta times um, negative sine of theta. And then you can plug in the points. Um, I guess I could should find what f prime of theta is. So this is equal to um, f of theta is one minus sine theta. So f prime of theta is negative cosine theta. So we've got negative cosine theta times sine of theta plus one minus sine theta times cosine theta all over negative cosine theta times cosine theta plus one minus sine theta times negative sine theta. And then you can plug in the point, well, we're over here when theta is zero. So if we plug in zero, we're gonna get cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero, plus one minus zero times one over negative one times one, plus one minus zero times one minus zero, that, oh, sorry, times zero, okay. So we end up with zero plus one over negative one plus zero, so negative one. So let's look at the slope there, I've probably drawn this not perfectly, is negative one. Hopefully that's the only example we should ever do of that because you're not doing that in class. But if you talk about this in class, let me know and we'll do more with it. Um, next time, because it is 431, we'll talk about finding mostly area, but also length and whatever the other thing is. There's, I guess arc length, oh, an area between, we can find area between two polar curves, which is probably the most interesting thing we do with polar curves. Yeah, we'll do that next time. And then I guess Thursday we'll review because it's the last day we meet because next week is the last week of class. So just as a reminder, this is week nine. Next week is week 10. 
you only have class next week on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday is the last day of class. It's also the last day we meet anyway. And then finals start Friday. You might not have a final on Friday, but finals start Friday. So just be aware, right? That's all coming up real soon. So start mentally preparing for all of that. So yeah, Tuesday, we will continue to talk about polar coordinate stuff. And then Thursday, we'll review final for finals in whatever way feels profitable. I'll see you all next week. A question about yeah. The, um, visits? Yes. Um, so, like, I just see yeah, yeah, let me see if that was something. So, you said for an odd multiple uh -huh. and you get that many times. You get that many. Is it a multiple of theta? Multiple of theta. Right. So it's like sine of so so like this coefficient out here is meaningless. Yeah. That's just that's just making the length of the power. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. It's the, it's the multiple of theta. So so when you did um where is that like um three cos three sine. Here's sine of three theta. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, maybe under that one. Maybe. It was on um, like three sine two theta. Three sine of two theta. It should be it's right. It's right there. Okay, so these are.